Welcome to Rising Stars, where Miriam Knight, publisher of New Consciousness Review, interviews exciting new voices in the world of progressive and transformational books, films, and ideas who offer intriguing perspectives on life, the universe, and everything in between. Join us as we celebrate the conscious awakening and explore many expressions of consciousness in action. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Miriam Knight, and my guest today is James Hogan. James is one of Canada's most experienced PR people and president of Hogan and Associates. He's a tireless advocate for ethics and integrity in public relations, and he has advised a wide range of organizations. He is the founder of Dismog Blog, an influential website that exposes misinformation campaigns around climate change and the environment. And he is the author of Climate Cover-Up and Do the Right Thing. His latest book is called I'm Right and You're an Idiot, The Toxic State of Public Discourse and How to Clean It Up. It reflects his concern about the polarizing and misleading tribal style of PR that is polluting public discourse today. I am very pleased to welcome him. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Jim, I found your book absolutely fascinating, and my copy now has so many dog-eared pages, it looks like an accordion. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Tell me why, you, you, why did you write the book, and how did you decide on the title? Well, I've, I've, um, I can, let me just talk about the title first. Uh, the title, it's kind of ironic because I was uh, having lunch with one of the, uh, Steve Rizal, who's a uh, sociologist and one of the leading um, experts in the United States on dialogue and using dialogue to uh, deal with uh, high levels of conflict. <clears throat> and we were having a lunch, and I was telling him that I was thinking about writing another book, and I was going to call it Duped and How. And uh, he was kind of alarmed, and he said, why would you write a book like that? He said, you know, right from the very beginning, you're turning it into a, you know, a polarized uh, book, and, and you're slapping it right on the cover. I think it's a terrible idea. So... I, you know, as time went on, I slowly, and it was actually a very slow <laughs> evolution for me as I spoke to people, I slowly realized that he was right. But once I finished the book and I, we were looking through the book for a, something that someone might have said as a good title, I came across he, what he said was, he said, look, if you say, you might as well, if you're going to say duped and how, you might as well say I'm right and you're an idiot. And so I thought, <laughs> wow, that is a really, when I read it right near the end, I thought it's a really ironic and catchy catchy title and it turned out to be he he kind of i'm not sure he was that happy that i used that as the title but um we wanted to get people's attention well it certainly does that uh I, when i was reading it and walking in public spaces it certainly caught a, a number of people's eyes and started conversations so uh tell me what was the background to your writing it <clears throat> well, there were a number of things that, um, one in particular, a number of events uh, in the, maybe, maybe about 10 years ago, I was asked to sit on uh, the board of the David Suzuki Foundation. And in Canada, the David Suzuki Foundation is one of the leading voices on um, environmental conservation. And David is a, a public educator, a television uh, host, and... Uh, a scientist. And the night, uh, the first day that for, of board meetings, um, it was very interesting and, you know, reading all sorts of interesting files on all of these environmental problems. And then we, we finished the board meeting. We went for dinner at this French bistro in old Montreal. And I was sitting right across from David. And he said, we were, we we're talking about kind of thing, the environment in general. And, and he was, he was saying to me, Look, you know, why is it that people don't get it? I mean, we people should be demanding that government and industry and society as a whole uh, stand up and do something about these problems that we're having with our ocean and the climate and so on. <clears throat> you know, why aren't people in the street? So he was asking me this, and I, you know, I'm I'm you know, a very experienced communications guy. I'm a corporate PR guy, really. I represent industry. 
but I've had a lot of experience in public debate and and uh, the sort of to and fro of arguing in public about various kinds of issues. But this question that David asked really stumped me. You know, he, and, and, and also I found it a bit kind of embarrassing because I think I was asked onto the board because of my background in public communications. <laughs> so to have no idea what the answer to this question was. And, and then as time went on, I realized that how central this question is. You know, when you think about climate, just think about climate change as as an example. Here you have a, a, a very, very serious problem if we're to believe all the science. And you have pretty much unanimity among scientists. You know, over 97% of scientists are, are are saying that it's it's real, humans are causing it, and it's a serious problem. You have massive amounts of data that have been gathering over the we've been gathering over the last three decades and yet if you look at greenhouse gas emissions they continue to rise i mean they may be leveling off a bit over these last two years but basically there's if you look at the trend it's up and so even though you hear all these words and you see all these people getting together to try to do something about it and thank god people are trying we still are not breaking through and actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions to the levels we need to reduce them. And so you look at that and you think, here you have all the evidence that you could possibly want. And if you look at the nature of of the public rhetoric and the public debate around this, you'd think that there was some kind of debate about whether or not it's a problem. And so that is another part of this. You look at this and you think it's astonishing. How much evidence do you actually have to have before you have enough to do something about a problem. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not just climate change. You could look at gun control issues. You could look at a whole range of different kinds of issues where we seem to be, as a society, very good at denial and at ignoring evidence and avoiding tough choices. And so it be, I became fascinated by this, the state of public discourse and what I came to think of as the polluted public square. Expand on the polluted public square for a bit and uh, maybe also uh, tell our listeners how you selected the people that you interviewed. You in- How many people did you interview? Well, it, actually, I interviewed some, about 70. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I mean, I, I started, uh, I mean, I, I can get to the polluted public square in a minute, but uh, the the way I chose people was I I started out thinking that it had something to do with the way we fashion uh, communications. So I was looking at it in a very basic level, and so I wanted to learn about you know was there something wrong with the way scientists were explaining the problems? You know, is there something that needed to be improved? So I started interviewing. Uh, 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 social psychologists. I started interviewing, and then very quickly, what you start to find out about is it's very complex. The the human communications is way more complicated than I ever knew it as a PR person. Um, and you, so I started to, you know, before I knew it, I was talking to people who study um, human values and the impact they have on the way we process information. Uh, tribalism, what's called cultural cognition. Uh, Jonathan Haidt calls it uh, groupish righteousness. Um, I started talking to people that look at human values, that look at self-justification, look at denial, uh, messaging, storytelling. <clears throat> and then I started to look at, you know, talk to people who are interested in conflict resolution. Um, and as I was doing this, I realized that ultimately – the deeper you dive into human communications, you go past words and stories into values and the sort of uh, the moral matrix that we live in as human beings to in, into people's spirituality. Mm. And, and in the sense, and I was looking at spirituality in the sense of, um, uh, not in the sense of uh, beliefs, but in the sense of, the, the kind of practical advice, you know, if you look at one of the women that I interviewed uh, was uh, Karen Armstrong, who is a best-selling author, and she wrote a book 
called um, she was she won the TED Prize in 2008, and she wrote a book called The Charter for Compassion. And uh, the, the when she won the TED Prize, they give you uh, two hundred I think two hundred thousand dollars to spend on a project to help make the world a better place. So she spent it on this book. And to write this book, she gathered together spiritual leaders from around the world, from all different kinds of faiths, and started to look at the sort of uh, the, 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 the rules of how we, how we disagree and, and, and the, the sort of the role of compassion and empathy uh, in public uh, debate and discourse. And uh, so when I talked to her, she said, one of the things that everyone agreed on was that all religions are based on the golden rule and that this idea that you don't want to do things to other people, that you don't want them doing to you. And if you look back to Confucius, if you look at, uh, you know, um, the, the Jewish religion, if you look at Christianity, if you look at the Muslim faith, all of these different religions have this golden rule right at their foundation. And uh, what she's saying is, she said, is that it's a mistake to think that that is some kind of dusty old spiritual piece of advice. This is advice that came to community leaders uh, when their community lived in a dangerous time. You know, Confucius, she used as an example. He had his version of the golden rule and he shared it with his community during a time of huge upheaval and great violence in China. And it, it's, a, it's a social rule. How do you interact with people that you disagree with and people who have, you know, very, very different interests that, that from you? Well, we're going to have to take a break at this point. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking that the golden rule has been perverted. Do to others before they can do to you. Right. Okay. We're speaking with Jim Hogan about, I'm right and you're an idiot. Stay with us. Jim, is there a website that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yes, uh, people can uh, just go to uh, uh, I'm right and you're an idiot dot com and they can get all sorts of information on the various people I interviewed for the book. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, uh, we were talking about two things that I want to go into more deeply. One is tribalism as a factor in communication. And uh, the other is appealing to values rather than facts. Take your pick. Yeah. So, so let me just start with the, this, with this tribalism uh, challenge, this tribalism problem, because in a way that was what Karen Armstrong was talking about with the golden rule. So if we're not following the golden rule, <laughs> that Karen Armstrong was talking about. <clears throat> um, one of the ways that that could happen is in this, this problem of tribalism. And I, I think of it as one of the ways that we pollute public discourse. And it, it, there are people in my industry, in the public relations business, who, when they represent an industry or a, or a political leader that is having difficulty making an argument... They resort to um, trying to massage the meaning of a certain issue, even science in the case of climate change, into something that has partisan meaning. So what ends up happening is rather than there being a debate about an issue or a conversation about the science, you end up having uh, a conversation about whose tribe you belong to. So what ends up happening is, you know, if, if people start to think that uh, if, if you think that, then you can't be one of us. You must be one of them. And so you end up with this uh, unfortunate state of affairs that people don't, you know, can, they, they resist information and evidence because of their tribal or their cultural or team affiliations. One of the fellows that I interviewed was a, a guy named Jonathan Haidt. And he says, uh, he, he said that, look, we're, we, humans are designed by evolution to divide into teams, to, to uh, unite against other teams, and this blinds us to the truth. And so we end up getting into this situation where 
the public's the, the the normal exchange of information that you would think would take place, the normal levels of debate don't take place because people are just trying to figure out whose team you belong to before they listen to what it is you're saying. Mm-hmm. And then they either agree with it or dismiss it even before they get to the bottom of it. So you end up with a you you, you end up with a barrier to 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 public debate and a barrier to thinking. I mean it, it basically prevents people from thinking about things deeply. It just pulls the shutters down. That's right. And now there are different ways of doing this. And one of the problems with this is that we, we tend to look at this as a problem that other people have. It's easier to see bias in others than it is in ourselves. But bias is a problem not just for the right, but it's also a problem for the left. It's a problem for human beings. And I, one of the people that I talked to, his name is Jason Stanley, he's a, a philosopher, and he said that, you know, it's a very good piece of advice to remember that we could be unknowingly under the influence of bias. I had people say to me, you know, one of the things that we should, Carol Tavares, who's a social psychologist who wrote a book called uh, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, <laughs> said that she felt that it, that it was really important that people hold their views lightly. Mm. Uh, there were people who said, uh, uh, you know, we should remember we could be wrong. Yeah, because the more lightly you hold your views, the easier it is to back off them if you do discover opposing facts. That's right. And, and, and you know, the other thing that she talks about is very, it's a very interesting book, uh, that Carol Tavares' book. Um, and she, she talked about something called self-justification. And self-justification is this mechanism that kicks in when we make a decision about something. Because we don't like how uncomfortable we feel when we're wrong. We like to think that we're smart, good people. And if something comes along to suggest that we're maybe not as smart as we think or as good as we think, we resist it through this mechanism of self-justification. She said people should understand that this, these forces of self-justification are every bit as powerful as thirst and hunger. These are really powerful forces. These aren't things that you can just easily think your way out of. Uh, and it's the same when you are you know, these tribal influences, these are, these are very powerful forces on the way we, we think, you know, denial, someone else told me, you know, denial is a full-time job. Denial is not just something you do as a whim and then forget it. If you're denying reality, you have to work at it because reality keeps kind of creeping in here and there. So you have to, it's like a full-time job. And the more you commit to something, the more self-justification strengthens, so the harder it is to be wrong. So open-mindedness, you know, the idea of having being kind of, you know, open-hearted, open-mindedness and open will towards things, this is not, a, I don't think, a, a symptom of weakness. I think this is a, is a survival strategy when we face some of the big problems that we face today uh, in the world. But you also mentioned that uh, people are less influenced by facts when they have an entrenched position than by an appeal to their values. What did you mean by that? Yeah, and, and this is, uh, I think that this is, a, this is both a, this is mainly a good thing, this is the way I was thinking about it, is that, that one of the reasons that, that um, I, I don't know if you, you've watched the climate change debate, but I've watched it in horror. And here you have all of these scientists with all the evidence on their side, and people trust them more than most others, having a debate with people who have virtually no science on their side, aren't really doing any science, but are basically ideologically driven. And either it's a stalemate, the debate, or scientists often lose the debate to people who don't have any evidence or credibility. Like, how is that even possible? Well, one of the reasons it's possible is because people shape information and facts to suit the belief system that they have. And whether it's their their cultural group or it's just their belief system, they reshape information. So it's almost like you want to be misled. And the person who normally mis- misleads you is you. And so facts don't work 
really well with a situation like that. So you, and, and, and arguably, even if it's not that bad, you, if you really want to be convincing to people, if you look at some of the great communicators, you know, you look at the Dalai Lama, look at uh, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, you look at Barack Obama, look at some of these great communicators. And one of the things you'll see in how they communicate, even the Pope, and if you look at the encyclical that he wrote on climate change, what you see is not just facts. Facts are important, but facts are not the, the most important part of a narrative. The most important part of the narrative is the, are the values. You know, well, I would say that the Donald Trump phenomenon is uh, probably the most blatant example of that. Yeah, and I, I, there there's something else, I think, going on. I mean, demagoguery is a bit different, but it, it's true. I mean, but I think what is going on there is that um, there's a recognition of how fearful people are, right? So you people are afraid of... Um, of what's of the change that's going on around them demographically. They're afraid of the change in their communities. They're, they're afraid of what's going on in the economy, uh, immigration. So, and, and people's, the, I think people's, uh, the public basically, the public mind is kind of beleaguered. And the pace of change and all of these other things uh, lead to a state of fear that's easy to manipulate. And so demagoguery is the business of talking to fear and reassuring it that you'll be able to fix all this stuff. So fear, rather than sort of stepping into uncertainty, which is really the nature of many of these big problems, it wants to be reassured that it doesn't have to be afraid, that it doesn't have to do all that hard work to become courageous. And so it basically listens to the demagogue. And so, so that's a little bit different than the values conversation that I'm talking about. Like I, I would say if you want a really good example, if you want a whole bunch of really good examples of um, uh, conversations about deeply held values, go to the Bible. Go to the, uh, I don't know, the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, spiritual um, teachings throughout history uh, have recognized the power of deep moral conversations. Mm-hmm. So, how does that relate to the pollution of the public square? Yeah. So, so what I would say is that you, the the public square is polluted by it's by by this tribalism that we've we've talked about, but it's also polluted by what you might call narrative failure, and that is that it's this it's in part of that is this naive belief in the power of facts, maybe relying a bit too much on the worldview of Descartes and this idea that, well, I have the evidence, I'm, I'm right. Look at all the science, right? Well, I think that what we've found, if the climate change uh, debate is a very good example of this, that facts are not enough. Facts that you need, you need to go deeper. And people like George Lakoff and... Marshall Gantz and a number of other people are doing some really interesting work on what you might call moral narrative um, or, or, or sort of conversations or storytelling that, that taps into deeply held values and, and, and it creates, turns fear into courage. And I, uh, so I think that when we, when we think that facts change minds in a, in a way that they don't, that that can actually pollute public discourse because you know, if you're not telling your story, then somebody else is going to come come along and tell it for you, and it may not be very good. And I think that's part of the confusion in public discourse. The other is this tribalism. The third part, though, that I think is a major problem is something you might call the advocacy trap. Now, I don't know if we have enough time to go into that right we, now. No, we don't, because we are about to take a break. But I did want to point out that the pollution of the public square is not simply from left or right. It's, it's an equal opportunity polluter. James, just before the break, you were talking about the issue of advocacy. And in your book, you actually give it a pretty bad rap. Why is that? Yes, and I, I just want to make cl- it clear that I'm, uh, you know, I think 
God, for Martin Luther King, and for for people who have advocated for change. The world is what it is. The good parts of the world are what they are because we've had advocates. And so advocacy, I think, is a very good thing, and we want to thank people who bother to get up off their couch and try to make the world a better place. But there is also a part of advocacy that can be really problematic, and um, there's a fellow that I interviewed uh, for the book. His name is Roger Connor, who is a conflict resolution uh, uh, expert and a lawyer, and he uh, he teaches at uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville. He he talks he writes about something called the advocacy trap, and, and what that is is that if I have a strong feeling about something and I care deeply about an issue that I become active on. Now I could be working for a, a you know civil, you know for a charity or a community group, or I could be working for government. I could be working for an industry, and but I I'm, I'm working on something I feel strongly about. I speak out about it, and then someone criticizes my position. There, we have a tendency to not react well to public criticism. And we tend to um, very often start to think of people who disagree with us on things we care deeply about, not just as wrong, but as wrongdoers. And so we move from a debate about issues quite quickly into a fight between good and evil. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we, and people who become, who fall into this advocacy trap get the energy for what they do out of their anger and sometimes hatred of these opponents that they have. And so the debate or whatever the fight is shifts from an effort to get to a solution to whatever the problem is that they're concerned about to an effort to defeat and, um, steamroll the people who disagree with them. So that advocacy trap is basically another source of pollution in public discourse. And the reason I think all of these things that I've talked about, and there are more, are bad, is because this habit of attacking the motives and characters of people who disagree with you basically distracts the public from the real issues. And it's sabotage. But that's what it's intended to do, isn't it? Uh, uh, no, no, I think it, I think the advocacy trap is done accidentally. It's done by the good guys. It's done by people who see the need for change and then just end up being so furious at people who disagree with them that they end up polluting public discourse as much as the guy who's pumping out the propaganda. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that the idea is that when you, when you kind of interrupt public conversations with this type of pollution, it sabotages discourse because it, kind of, it discredits the passion and the outrage that are at the heart of healthy public debate. So it's, they're kind of anti-democratic, um, uh, you know, accusing opponents of corrupt and untrustworthy motives makes it easy to, to dismiss well-founded criticism. You know, um, mm-hmm. it leaves, it, it, people know, most of us know, that the solutions to these incredibly difficult problems are we find them somewhere on the common ground. And if we hide the, 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 the location of those solutions through this kind of highly polarized, hateful discourse where, you know, debate becomes name calling and ad hominem attacks on people, where you're questioning people's character and all that, you're talking about something different. And that is not really going to move us forward to any kinds of solutions. And, you know, one of the things Peter Senge said to me was, you know, these problems, problems like climate change, problems of the kind of things we're doing to our oceans, these problems with um, these mass murders, uh, people walking around with these military style weapons, these problems are not going to be, uh, are not going to be dealt with by you and your friends. They have, they're problems that, require reaching across the aisle to the other side and figuring out ways to work with people that you don't particularly like. Well, this is just the essence of the issues that we've been having with Congress, that no one is willing to reach across the aisles, that ad hominem attacks are the norm rather than the exception. How do we bridge these gaps? Yeah, and I and I think... Um, you know, it, it, 
it's not like anybody's in control of this. <laughs> um, this is an out of control, I think an out of control situation. You, this kind of un, this culture of unyielding one sidedness. It is, but I think in part, it's human nature. It's this, you know, we, we really, it's easy for us to fall into these strong, hateful feelings of, of the, when we feel threatened by the other tribe. Um, and so, you know, there has to be a willingness and to change. I think that's, uh, part of it. And maybe I could tell you a, a story about the time I spent with Thich Nhat Hanh talking about this and the Dalai Lama. So they were two people that I interviewed for my book. Uh, so Thich Nhat Hanh and uh, the mayor of Vancouver and David Suzuki and I spent an afternoon together a few years ago when he was in Vancouver. And we were talking about uh, the environment. And uh, he was talking about meditation and how meditation is a good thing to bring into the protection of the environment and fight for protecting the environment. And he was talking about the role of inner ecology. And, and so I started to think, you know, what are you, what are you saying? Are you saying we, you know, we shouldn't be advocates. So I said to him, one of your monks told me that you had put uh, pictures of police who were harassing your nuns and monks uh, up on a website uh, in Vietnam to shame them because of what they were doing to these these uh, monks and nuns. Now, that's advocacy. So you're not saying that we shouldn't be advocates, are you? And he he has this way. I mean, he's just this powerful man of you sort of feel like he's looking into your soul and he knows more about you than you know yourself. <laughs> and he's kind of looking deeply into me and right, right eye to eye. He's like about two feet away from me. And he said... He put his finger up and he said, speak the truth, but not to punish. Mm. And I remember thinking, whoa, you know, that is an incredible lesson uh, for anyone who's an advocate. That if you really, really care, you have to bother with common ground. And you have to, you have to you have to start to self-examine to see whether or not some of the obstacles, some of the obstacle to change is not being created by you yourself. There's another aspect to that admonition, speak the truth but not to punish, that I was reflecting on when I read it. Because so often we feel aggrieved and we want to lash out and get revenge instead of trying to uh, see where the other person is coming from. I think in, in one of the interviews, the advice given was to try and reflect or say, speak the position of the other side to get to the point where you actually listen and can understand where they're coming from and this is something that we really have difficulty doing. That's right. I, I, I do think that, I, I think particularly when you, it's about something that you care deeply about and you've decided the other side is, is up to mischief on, right? So, so there's a kind of a, <clears throat> a perfect storm of misperception there. And so, so much of the anger comes from misperception and the clearing up of misperception, contrary to what, and I've been in the communications business for almost 30 years, and, and I can say from personal experience that miscommunications and misperception more often comes from bad listening than it does from bad communications. That people don't realize that you have to understand who you're talking to and where they're coming from before you communicate, not no, it's not a, it's, it's not, you should, it shouldn't be an assumption. And, and I think it doesn't hurt to be affirmative of what it is that people, you know, find something. I mean, if the Dalai Lama can be compassionate and feel empathy to people in Beijing, surely we can have a conversation with a climate change denier. I mean, <laughs> and, and try to figure out something that they're right about. That was one of the keys, wasn't it? To try and find at least some tiny piece of common ground. Right. And in fact, I think you would find 
Um, see, I think part of it is getting over this idea that you're surrounded by evil or, or that the people who are, deba- are are fighting what seems to be scientific, overwhelming scientific evidence and urgency are, are bad, that they're up to something, right? That we need to get over that because that's actually most of the time not true. They're just people who disagree. And I think being able to kind of go back and forth uh, and look for common ground, and I think most of the time there's far more than a little bit. There's probably like 80%. And so, and I've seen it happen in dialogues between oil companies and up here in Canada over the tar sands, between oil companies and environmental groups. And light light bulbs go off on both sides. And you don't have to change reality. You don't have to say that climate change isn't a problem to, to, to find that common ground. Mm. But you do change reality to remain entrenched in your position. Well, I think that you... um, Change your perception of it anyway. Yeah, well, I think changing your perception of the intentions of the other person is a part of what I'm talking about, right? So that that you see that a lot of the time that the oil guy, he, th- there may be a fellow on the other side, and this is actually what I saw in the example that I'm talking about in these dialogues that we organized across Canada and in London. And there were people who work in the oil patch uh, in the tar sands who are, ju- are very concerned about climate change. But on the other, you, know, you don't even get a chance to hear that, right? And so if the oil guy thinks that the environmentalist is like a radical who doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And, and if the environmentalist thinks that the oil guy is somebody who's just trying to pick everybody's pocket and only cares about money and so on. So that, that actually creates an environment where there isn't even a space for a conversation. When in reality, if you take a look and you start to have the conversation, you realize that your perception of the other person is just not true. So that's why listening is so much more important than talking. Yes, it's like Don Miguel Ruiz's fifth agreement. Be skeptical, but listen. (laughs) It can be so dispiriting to look at the polluted state of the public square and listen to the political debates. I was surprised at how Canadian political debates are almost as bad as ours. Really, I thought you guys were much more elevated than that. Shame on you. Yeah, I know. It's very hard to be smug now. <laughs> very, very hard. It's, this, it's, it's very similar. And, um, and it's, it's not just in North America. You're seeing the same thing in the UK right now. You're seeing it in France. You're seeing it in Hungary and various parts of, of Europe where the the, 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 the debate becomes so incredibly polarized that there essentially there is no common ground. The only thing that the, 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 the direction that it heads in is defeat. You've got to defeat the other, the other party. And, and, and part of that, you know, when you're talking about an election or you're talking about a decision that's, you know, part of it, it's a bit more understandable, but <clears throat> that style of public discourse has migrated out into community conversations where I don't think it belongs. Mm. How, do How do we overcome, overcome it? it? Well, <clears throat> so, so when I was, um, I think we have to stop doing the things that, that provoke it. I mean, stop making it worse. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things I said earlier was that we, we need to approach these debates and these disagreements uh not as i'm not suggesting that people just get along better like i i think we should have passionate disagreements but i think we should assume that people who disagree with us are well-intentioned and not idiots and, and maybe until we prove otherwise but but i think we are not surrounded by evil people who are idiots. We, it just isn't the case. And, and I think a lot of the time we are blinded by our own self-righteousness when we get drawn into important issues that we're trying to do something about. We're anyway, made so, blind and deaf. That's right. And we don't hear. And we don't see. And we are not going to solve the problem. So, so if we're interested in change, 
then I think we need to explore uh, one thing that I that I really love that in the interview with Peter Senge, who teaches at uh, Sloan School at MIT, he said, the quality of any intervention is determined by the inner quality of the intervener. Mm. And so you have to come from a place of good intention. But I don't think that should be seen as some kind of weakness that says, oh, you know, it's time to head off to the caves and meditate. Um, I think that uh, although that's important to sort of take care of your inner health, I think it's also important to speak up and speak up with a strong voice. Disagree. But I think there's this also this need to sort of assume that there are good intentions on the other side. Anyway, so that's kind of a first step. But in addition to that, uh, let me just tell you about um, uh, this moment with the Dalai Lama. So I went to Dharamsala and interviewed the Dalai Lama. And they gave me three questions that I could ask him. So I was, <laughs> it was like I was so nervous. I still can't. I couldn't even look at the tape from the interview for six months. <laughs> It was so it was so nerve wracking. But anyway, he's an an amazing person. In fact, I spent five days with him, and Joan Halifax was there. Roshi Joan Halifax, uh, and amazing amazing people in, in Dharamsala. We were there for five days, and then at the, near the end of that, I interviewed him privately. And uh, right at the very end of the interview, the camera was being turned off, and he we stood up, and he put his finger on my forehead, and he said. Uh, we like to think the Western mind is more sophisticated, but I think the Tibetan heart may be stronger. Maybe if we take the Western mind and the Tibetan heart and we put them together, we can start to fix this problem. And we were talking about climate change. And I remember thinking afterwards, it was a very special moment, and I remember thinking... Uh, uh, about so many of the things that he had said during that five days and the interview about warm heartedness and the, and the need to, to bring warm heartedness into these disagreements. Now, just, I know it makes it much more difficult. It's, you know, when, when you're angry and, and somebody's disagreeing with you, it's much easier to hate them or to assume that they're evil. So do you have a, some justification for hating them or hating what they stand for. But I, I do think that there needs to be a kind of, uh, we need to be more open. And I think warm heartedness helps do that. Uh, and I think we don't want to be fighting about the wrong things. Uh, we want to figure out ways that we can explore common ground. That said, I'm not saying that people shouldn't, uh, polarize sometimes. I mean, sometimes you do have to polarize. Uh, sometimes it's really important to to show the difference between right and wrong. But it can't just all be about polarization. It also has to be about finding common ground. So it's a, you know, someone who's a who wants change on whatever the issues are that are really important. We need to do both, and we need to get good at both. And so. I think part of it is in understanding uh, a narrative that is more friendly to people we disagree with. It's called, uh, uh, there's a, something that uh, is called pluralistic advocacy, which is basically developing narratives and developing stories that leave a little bit of room for people who may be on the other side of the issue when you can. And so as opposed to just making it a, fight between good and evil and making it such a black and white decision. We seem to be very uncomfortable with gray. We gravitate towards black and white. It makes us feel more secure. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. And, and I think that it's uh, anger and uh, fear are very powerful. Mm. Yeah. And people. Well, who, love is said to be very powerful too, and that's, that's what right. Dalai Lama is advocating. That's right, and so I think it's a kind of a self. I mean, the big part of this is self exploration, and but I think we should never underestimate. I mean, I've had some very bad reactions from people who who think that I'm saying we should just get along better, which I'm actually not saying that. I mean, I, I, I I'm not saying that we should just go along with things that we know are wrong. I think we need to stand up and try to change these things. But I think we need to do it in a way that's effective. And if what we're doing is only sort of driving ourselves to a kind of a perpetual paralysis, 
and you drive the issue to perpetual paralysis where nothing ever gets done, then we need to re-examine uh, the skill set that we're bringing to the table. We can only control what we can do. We can't control the world. It's a big place. You also made the distinction between trying to arrive at consensus versus actually engaging in dialogue. That's right. So the idea is not to agree with something that's wrong. The, the idea behind dialogue is to, to build understanding, uh, examine possibilities, you know, sort of look at different ways that you can deal, uh, you can deal with a problem. And the dialogue on its, in, in, in its own, on its own is weak. So you can't have di- dialogue is not the solution to all of this. You, you need the polarization and the dialogue, right? You can't have, uh, you, you can't, you can't expect, um, people to s- succeed at dialogue, uh, if there's no reason for one of the parties to really engage in a dialogue. Mm-hmm. The reason, so, if, you're not going to, if the, if everything is going just fine for all the oil companies, they're not going to talk to you. <laughs> they're not going to care as much about climate change as you want them to. So, so you, there needs to be a reason for them to sit down. Thus, the need for advocates and environmentalists and polarization. So there needs to be a reason for people to come to the table. And, uh, but when they get to the table, there's something different that can go on there. And so you need kind of both. Right. Right. Oh, my goodness. So, um, did, did you learn many things that were very surprising to you? Well, one of the things that was really surprising to me is how much, how much of a part of the problem I was personally. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I had no idea. I thought, I thought I was actually writing a book for other people. And as I got through this, I, one of the things I realized was this is really had a lot to do with me and that I really think that self-examination is a really big part of this. Um, I think trying to kind of bring your best self and your best understanding to these kinds of issues that you, that we work on, on, I mean, I'm, I'm involved in environmental issues, but I think it works the same with, with other issues. And so I think, uh, that is really helpful. And, and I, I also think the idea that a lot of these people were not evil, uh, <laughs> was a bit of a surprise. I, I also think the thing that Thich Nhat Hanh said about speak the truth but not to punish, that was transformative for me. I mean, personally, I just thought, whoa, that is, that's such an astonishing piece of advice. And he, But he's saying speak the truth. So he's not saying you shouldn't speak out. He's saying that make sure what you're saying is actually true, uh, that you have evidence for it, that you that you can feel comfortable that what you're saying is accurate. And true, and that, that that your purpose is change in education, maybe, and not so much punishing people who disagree with you. And um, and I think in all of that is, a, you know, when you start to think about it deeply, is an is an insight into human nature uh, and my own uh, human nature. And so that was it was a very powerful. The whole thing was a really powerful, painful experience, as I said earlier. Well, your entire book is a, a powerful and somewhat painful experience as well. As I mentioned earlier, when you think of the corners that we uh, back ourselves into, but at least there are some insights as to how to work your way out of them. So I want to thank you very much for this wonderful book, James. Uh, I'm right and you're an idiot. The Toxic State of Public Discourse and how to clean it up. James Hogan. And your website is I'm right and you're an idiot.com. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Thank Thank you so, so much. much for being with us and so much for your book. Thank you. I'm Miriam Knight. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>